friends in Christ, good evening. This is not how we had hoped to gather for our Ash Wednesday worship, uh, but uh, as uh, with so many people that I talked with, the consensus was we'd almost prefer the inches of snow over ice or the possibility of ice. And so for the, uh, for the safety of our members, uh, we decided that uh, we would uh, only do virtual for this time. And so we are in our homes. Uh, as you can tell, I am in my home as well. And perhaps that is fitting for this evening. Fitting in the sense that uh, Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent is a focus on ourselves, certainly as individuals, but also fitting that we are together because it is a communal worship. It is about a change not just in us, but in the community, y'all, in the language we have been using recently. There will be no ashes this year. And I do miss that it is a powerful symbol, particularly as a pastor, to place ashes on the forehead of parishioners from those who I know I will bury in the year or years ahead down to the child I baptized just a few weeks ago. But it is also something that can be accomplished in our time together. Remembering now that we are dust and to dust we shall return. And there will be something that I will invite you to do during our reflection on the gospel text. But for now, it is good that we are gathered together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts so that truly repenting of our sins we may receive from you the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading comes tonight from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at the sixth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Jesus said to the disciples, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So on a day where our Christian piety is most visible, especially if you have your imposition of ashes done early in the morning on any other Ash Wednesday than this, so on a day where it is visible, literally you're wearing your piety on your forehead, we hear words from our Lord Jesus that challenges that very display. Or does it? Our text is a continuation of Jesus' first sermon in Matthew, his deep explanation of what it means to follow him and to live in the reign of heaven. Here, Jesus is talking about how we live out our faith in the world. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the advice to churches from those inside and out that we need to be more visible. That if we want people to join us in following Jesus, we need to show what we do to post about the things we already do so that people know how we feed others, how we worship, who we visit uh, to comfort in their time of need, the quilts that we make that even now earthquake victims are wrapping around them to tell others about all the good that we do for our neighbors. And yet Jesus seems to be telling us in this text to not advertise, to not sound the trumpet, to not be visibly pious in front of others. And Jesus has also told us earlier in this Sermon on the Mount that we should let our light so shine before others that they may see our good works, which seems to be telling us to sound the trumpet. And leads us to scratch our heads and wonder, well, okay, what's going on here? Well, first, keep this in mind. Jesus does not tell us to stop fasting, praying, and helping others. These are ways in which we are encouraged to express our faith towards God. What he's warning against is doing so in order to be seen by folks. In order to have them look at us and say, ooh, what a righteous people. In order to get a reputation here on earth. If that's all you're worried about, Jesus says, what people in the world think, then that's the reward you'll get. A fine reputation on earth, but nothing in the reign of heaven. Second, look again at that text where Jesus tells us to let our light so shine before others. See, the purpose is not for our own reputation so that folks gaze adoringly at us in our righteousness. No, the phrase is, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. To praise God for what God has done, to point beyond ourselves to the one who is creator of all things. The benefit to us in these actions lies in doing them because that's who we are, and this is what God has called us to be. Maybe what Jesus is getting at here is that congruence of self that Jesus says the honorable people have. Those who pursue the righteousness of God both internally as well as in their actions. For God's sake, not their own reputations so that others may give glory to God because, well, we are striving to embody the reign of heaven so that others may see God active in our lives and believe in God so that they might follow after us as we trail along after Jesus. It sounds a lot like the definition of character I heard over and over again growing up. 
Character is who you are when nobody is looking. Character asks the question of you, what do you do if basically you could get away with anything right now? Jesus says, you want to follow me? Then live out your faith for the benefit of others and to the glory of God. Not for yourself, not for yourselves, for y'all, the community. And the way Jesus phrases this is, don't be like the hypocrites. Now note here, hypocrites in this passage are not people who say one thing and do another. Even people of faith do that all the time. Rather, the hypocrites are those who put on a show for public approval, for a specific audience of their peers. And unfortunately, this is one of the pitfalls of our society, that we can put on a show for people just to win their approval, and it'll work. If we do these particular things, if we mouth these words, if we make a pilgrimage to this particular person, just to please other people and get their affirmation, well, all kinds of things can happen. We can get elected. We can attain influence. We can sell more things. We can get more clicks and likes. But Jesus warns us, know that that's all it will gain you. The benefit stays here in this realm. The reign of this world, not of heaven. And as Jesus says, what does it gain you if you have all the wealth and influence, and clicks, and likes, and followers here on earth. Can you use any of that to buy your life? You want your actions to mean something beyond this life, Jesus says. Do it because that's who you are. Do it to help those who are sick, and hungry, and hurting. Do it because it's right. Don't make a show of it. Just get on doing it. How often today do we, or others, use religion to reinforce our own interests more than that of God? And it's not just the televangelists who ask for donations because apparently God has decided they need another airplane. No, I didn't make that one up. And it's not just a pastor who backs a certain position because they know they're going to get the approval of their congregation if they do. It's us. It's each and every one of us. Strive first for the reign of God and for God's righteousness, Jesus says, and all else will come. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, the righteousness of God, for that character, and do it continuously. Pursue it with the same hunger as those who make it to the NFL and then make it to the Super Bowl. A hunger and thirst that shapes the rest of their living. Think of Tom Brady. Now, for a goal like winning the Super Bowl, an earthly goal, I would argue it isn't worth it. Think of what the most successful people in any given field tend to give up. But when we are striving for the reign of God, that hunger and thirst for righteousness will benefit all the whole community as well as ourselves. It will lead to a deeper and more connected community. And we'll be rewarding in the here and now as well as in the time to come. When our audience is God, you will be restored, given back, rewarded. And when you do acts of charity, when you give alms, when you pray, when you fast, do so for the audience of God. For God and God's glory alone, regardless of what anyone else thinks. Do it because that's who you are. As we enter the season of Lent, we enter into 40 days of intentional self-reflection. Similar to the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness following the revelation of who he was at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descending on him, this voice from above. Lent is a time to get clear in our heads who we have been claimed and called to be claimed in those same waters of baptism. It's a time to get our heads on straight before we go back into the world to change it and shape it. 
for the sake of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit to look more like the reign of heaven. And during these 40 days, we will focus on the disciplines Jesus calls us to in this text. Prayer, fasting, charity to others. We'll sit more frequently at the feet of Jesus so that we might better hear and understand to be trained in the way that we should go. And Ash Wednesday is the start of this time of more intentional work. I've talked about this before. It's a bit like spring training in baseball. It's a time to work on the fundamentals, to pay more attention to how we work together as a team, to clarify what our goal is this year. We do not meet this particular Ash Wednesday to have ashes imposed on our foreheads, but I would invite each of you tonight, before you go to bed, perhaps for each other, if you live with others in your household, take some water on your finger, trace the sign of the cross on your forehead or on the forehead of somebody in your household and tell them you are a beloved child of God. A reminder of that baptismal claim, a reminder that you have already died and been resurrected. And a reminder that it is only God who brings life fuller and more abundant. And then let us wake up tomorrow morning ready to practice our faith, not for the audience of this world, but for the sake and the glory of the God who has given us so much. The one who is creator of all that exists, who came, who came down to us in Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, to show us how much God loves us and who moves among us still in the breath of life and creativity that is the Holy Spirit. Let us do that as individuals, but also as a community, together, y'all. Because, with God's help, all things are possible. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, Today, with the whole church, we enter a time of remembering Jesus' Passover from death to life, and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season of Lent by acknowledging our own need for repentance, a change in thinking and action, acknowledging those places we have fallen short of the glory of God, and naming our need for God's mercy. We were created to experience joy in communion with God, to love one another, and to live in harmony with creation. But our sinful rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, so that we do not enjoy the life that our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from love of God and love of neighbor. And so I invite you, therefore, to the disciplines of Lent. Practices of self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting of generosity through sacrificial giving and works of love. And to do these strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. Let us continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. And now let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our fault by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. And as a community, we say, have mercy on us. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. And as a community, we say, have mercy on us. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. And as a community, we say, have mercy on us. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you, have mercy on us. Our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you, have mercy on us. Our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you, have mercy on us. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, we confess to you, have mercy on us. Our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you, have mercy on us. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. And now, turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, renew the hearts of your faithful people across all nations and generations. Rescue your church, your church where it suffers from affliction, hardship, or persecution. Remove all obstacles, internal and external, that stand in the way of our witness to your grace, mercy, and everlasting love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Renewing God, bless your creation. Strengthen roots and seeds beneath the soil that await their time to flourish. Grant good weather to come that the bounty of the earth may feed us all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Restoring God, rebuild and repair nations ravaged by war, famine, pandemic, and strife. Humble the hearts of governments and authorities, that they loose the bonds of injustice and liberate the oppressed. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Generous God, provide bread for the hungry, shelter for the homeless, and protection for the vulnerable. Listen to the cries of all who are abused, imprisoned, and who suffer due to pain, anxiety, or illness. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Faithful God, renew our practices of devotion and discipleship. Make us generous in giving, steadfast in prayer, and attentive to your grace amid the many distractions of our lives. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Redeeming God, you raise us from the dust of the earth and mark us with a cross of salvation. Strengthen us by the faithfulness of the saints and restore our joy and lead us by your bountiful grace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. 
Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. A couple of quick announcements before we dismiss. First, there is no women's Bible study or Dorcas quilters tomorrow morning, again, out of an abundance of caution. We do invite you to join us again next Wednesday, Soup Supper at 6 o'clock p.m., uh, 7 o'clock p.m. for our worship. Our worship will focus on uh, the devotions that are available on our website, stjohnely.org. There's also links in our e-news. These are uh, devotions that have been provided by the Southeastern Iowa Synod, uh, and so we are participating in these with many congregations across uh, Southeastern Iowa. They start today. Uh, they're a weekly focus. I invite you to uh, join me in that journey. There also is a link uh, through that uh, same website for daily devotionals if you wish to have those emailed to you by the Synod. And now, friends... I pray that the rest of your time with family is blessed. I would invite you to uh, do that reminder of our claim in baptism and that same mark of the cross on our foreheads with one another using water uh, before you go to sleep tonight, perhaps uh, first thing in the morning. As we begin this 40-day journey in Lent, a journey that I am excited to take with you. And now, friends in Christ, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And together we say, thanks be to God. God's blessings to all of you. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.